Well, praise the Lord, everybody. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to The Christian and the Culture, a program designed to help you confront the issues that confront us without backing up and being afraid. What does God's Word have to say about the many trials and tests that we experience? First Peter tells us that we are the elect of God, chosen by the sovereign will of God, and we are not to allow this current world to put us in bondage. So welcome to The Christian and the Culture, where you learn some tips and some principles to help you live above the cultural depression. I'm Pastor Eric Lambert of Bethel Deliverance International Church, and joining me are two outstanding men of God who bring the mind and the will of God to our time together. That would be Pastor Timothy Baldwin of Bethel Deliverance Church Northeast and Pastor Brian Weatherspoon of Tabernacle Harvest Church in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. Gentlemen, greet our audience this morning. God bless you, Christian and the Culture family. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us today, and we look forward to our spirited debate today. <laughs> <laughs> Very good way to say spirited debate. Bishop already <laughs> laid the groundwork. You already laid the groundwork, so I'm, I'm ready to jump in. Y'all stay tuned. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, gentlemen, for be consenting to be with us today to lend your wisdom and expertise to this exciting time. You know, in driving today, I was thinking about the coming of the Lord, and I'm really excited about Jesus coming back, not to rescue me from the world, but just the fact that soon he's going to bring me into his presence, and I'll spend eternity with my heavenly father and my elder brother, Jesus. So we want all of you to be excited. Don't be down. Don't be frustrated. These light afflictions are only for a moment. But yes, while sir. we're here, we're supposed to make a difference. We should be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Now, there is a passage, Pastor Tim said, a spirited debate, and the Bible <laughs> teaches you will have what you say. So in <laughs> Romans chapter 12, NIV says from verse 9, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. He tells us to hate what is evil and cleave to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, your spiritual fire, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in tribulation, faithful in prayer. Now, I want to stop right there, because he says love must be sincere. We should hate what is evil, but cling to what is good. How do we process that today, given the fact that most of what we see in our culture is evil? How do we hate what is evil, but cling to that that is good? So help our listeners today to understand what does that mean? What is Paul trying to say? Pastor Brian, you take the first shot. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Bishop. Um, you know, I have to go back to history. Um, and, and when you study, and uh, I love history, so when you study first, second century, uh, and even into the third, kind of the Maccabean revolt, you'll see something happens in Rome with the Christians or the Jewish Christians. And uh, one thing they did was show their disdain for anything that was of emperor worship. They were asked to burn candles unto the emperor. They did not. So these were actions. Uh, they, they ultimately decided not to go to the Colosseums uh, because they would do the uh, Greco games and they would have all kinds of other things and ultimately the place where Christians would be slaughtered. So they, never, they, they did not do that. Uh, they did not bow nor pay any kind of uh, a, admission or any kind of worship unto the emperor. So they demonstrated, uh, it, history says they didn't even join the military because they were so against anything that was emperor oriented. So in short, we can't do all those things, but we can make up our mind in action to make sure that we're not going along with the cultural, uh, the norms or the new norms, if you will. So mm. action is going to be what it takes. Okay, that's good. Now you, you're really laying out the pattern for separate lifestyle. Amen. That's really what you're what you're uh, giving us the mindset for 
that yep. we should live separate. We should really make a clear and intentional decision to glorify Christ in all that we do. That's good, Amen. Pastor Brian. But Pastor Amen. Tim, I want to narrow this a little bit for you because I don't want you to be able to piggyback off of what <laughs> Pastor Brian says. <laughs> but when we get to this passage that says that we should hate what is evil and love what is good. Now, does that mean that I can isolate certain things and people and hate them but then when he says, hate what is evil, cleave to that which is good. Let's look at the, uh, the, get the, lay, the, mm, the gay and the lesbian community. How do I take that passage, Pastor Tim, and make it work with what we're seeing in the world today? Yeah, Bishop, you know, he uses two words there. He says hate and, and uh, uh, cleave to. He says Hate, and we know that hate, that word hate is really to dislike or have horror for. This is that word like actually means to have horror for something or to some, uh, like disdain for it. And then he says to cleave to, right? And so to cleave to is to fasten ourselves to, to something, to fasten oneself to or connect ourselves to. And so when I look at it from that perspective and the subject that you just brought up, um, again, as believers, uh, we, we have this responsibility to live separate uh, from the world. But when you talk about hating something, from this context, it's not that we hate the people. We don't hate people at all, but we abhor, like the scriptures say, or we are horrified of things that horrify God. And so for us as believers, it's our responsibility to say, hey, listen, we do not condone, stand with, or connect ourselves to things uh, that God would not connect himself, uh, himself to, things that he have that, that, that he abhors. And so we should do the same. And then it says, again, it talks about connecting ourselves to. We can't connect ourselves to an agenda that God is calling us to disconnect from. So, so again, we all have people in our families who sin, who are ungodly, but it doesn't stop our love for them. Okay. But it does not mean that we connect with them and do what they do and agree with what they agree with. And so, again, those two words are key for me to abhor and to cleave to. I, I, I have horror for the things that God has horror for. Yeah. And, and, and I cleave to and love the things that God loves. And, and that, that's my perspective on it. It's, it's, it's hard to be a Christian. It's easy to get saved. <laughs> It, yeah. It's real easy to get saved. <laughs> yeah. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Yeah. You know, believe God uh, raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. But it's hard to go day by day walking yeah. through a world that, as Pastor Tim says, continues to commit acts that horrify God. And then we must respond in a way that does not drive the person away from God. I need to share uh, this with you today. I responded to uh, an ad that was in, not an ad, but an article that was in a newspaper or a magazine online. And uh, when I began to talk about it, I got so much backlash. And I mean, it was horrible, the things that they were accusing me of, homophobia, all this other stuff. And all I said was, I'm in agreement with the word of God that says Jesus loves us that God gave Jesus to die for us, but I am not in agreement with certain lifestyles. And in my ignorance, I just used the word lifestyle to talk about human life. They thought I was singling out the gay and lesbian community, which I was not doing. Right. And this thing went on back and forth. Every time I would try to write something, they would write back and, oh, it was horrible, the things that they said. <laughs> wow. So the Spirit of God put in my mind, stop responding to them in my words, and just put scripture up. So yeah. I put up Romans chapter six, all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. And then yeah. I put up, if our gospel is hid, it is hid from those who are lost and whom the God of yeah. this world has blinded. Do yes. you know, up until today, I have not received one response from the <laughs> word of God. Amen. And I Amen. thought yeah. that was very interesting. Interesting, because you can't you fight, fight the word of God. God. You can yeah. fight me, but you can't fight the word of God. Now, Amen. I use that, that to segue into what Paul says here when he says that the Christian being confronted by all of these things, he says we must be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. All right, unpack that for us today. What is he saying when he says that we're to be joyful in hope? 
How does that happen? Pastor Brian? Yeah, joyful and hope. Uh, you know, once again, we've got to go back to where Paul was. And, you know, Paul is uh, one of those who was one of the first in Rome, uh, not necessarily, doesn't even really build a church in Rome in as much as he's there as a political prisoner, as one who's kind of, you know, uh, against the, uh, the Roman emperor guy, kind of. And so Paul is still encouraging the believer that even though the words preached and things said, Christ returned because they did believe Christ is going to return then. Uh, they didn't think this was going to be 2,000 years in the future. They thought his return was upon them then. And so Paul is still saying, listen, be joyful in the hope that Christ is coming back to get us. Mm. Keep on. Stay with fervor. Stay diligent. Those are all the words following. Uh, remain faithful, patient. Even though you're going to have some tribulation, don't rush to get out of it. Why? God is going to get glory from all of these things that are going on. But they did believe that the coming of the Lord, coming back to get them, was really upon them then. So okay. he was telling them to stay faithful. That's good. That's good. We should stay faithful yes, and sir. never give up. And we should be joyful in the hope that he's coming to get us. Now, Pastor Tim, I'm going to throw two curveballs at you where he says, Pastor Brian's dealt with be joyful and hope. But then he goes on to say, patient and tribulation. Now, before you answer that, I want to give you verse 14, where he says, bless those who persecute you. So take patient in affliction and bless those who persecute you in light of what we're seeing in our culture. So many Christians are trying to warn people about persecution, and they're blaming it on the Democrats and saying the Republicans are a certain way, the Democrats are a certain way. But Paul is saying we should be patient in affliction and bless those who persecute you. What's your take on this? So, so when Paul says be patient, he's saying endure. Mm -hmm. He's saying endure, uh, again, back to what Pastor Brian says, endure and hold on to your faith. Be patient, that because it, especially in the end times, as, as Scripture tells us, that there is going to be tribulation, and there is going to be there is going to come a season where Christians have to learn to endure persecution, where we have to learn to endure hardship, and be able to stand and bear the weight of whatever the hardship may look like. There's coming a time to this country, and, and I think that time is upon us where uh, the weight of our belief is going to cause a major level of persecution on us. And we're going to have to do one or two things. We're going to have to stand stand firm. or, we're, or th There are going to be individuals who flee from the faith because of it. You know. And when he talks about uh, blessing those who curse you, we are to be the model of what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not puffed up. It does not seek its own. All of those attributes of love, when you look at that, bless those who curse you or bless those who persecute you, it's our responsibility, again, to respond in a way that is uh, the total antithesis of what the world does. Amen. I know I grew up in a home where it says, you know, if someone hits you, you know, you have a responsibility to hit them back. Amen. You know, and that and then you come to Christ and 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 then we get this text here that says, Well, bless those who curse you. You know, so again, we have that responsibility to be the example and to 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 toe the line of who Christ is and who he was while he walked this earth. Now, you know, many of our people struggle with applying practical lessons such as these. Yes. I mean, a lot of people look for the super spiritual revelations and illuminations from the word of God. But these are what I like to call practical protocols. You know, yeah. uh, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be patient, be faithful, continue on in this in this life for God. But notice now, as he continues this this teaching in Romans 12, he says we should strive to live in harmony one with another. Now, if there's one thing that I believe has harmed and hurt the heart of God is the last political election where Christians were fighting against each other. And I agree, Pastor Brian said, there is no organized church in Rome, but there are Christians there. And Paul's, Paul's writing and instruction was live in harmony one with the other. Now, I'm going to ask both of you gentlemen to give some insight to this because of many of our people coming up there is such a division in the body of Christ along racial lines, ethnic lines, yeah. you know, yes. financial uh, arenas. How can we live in harmony one with another? Pastor Brian? Amen. We've got to see the bigger picture, Bishop. 
And, you know, harmony is not a worldly language. It's a heavenly one. Because everything in heaven flows. Nothing in heaven is out of order. Everything has its proper arrangement and organization. The world did before sin. It was harmonious. Now that sin has entered in, it's going to take work. And so now we're talking about intentionality. We have to be very intentional to make sure we don't allow racism to govern our heart or motives. Make sure money is not the motivator. So for us, it's going to take more work, be very intentional about bringing a harmonious standard to it. Now, I'm going to say this last thing. Pastor Tim talked about persecution. You mentioned it, Bishop. It's in the text. It's going to happen. If nothing else, if our intentionality doesn't work, if our gatherings don't work, persecution will. There will be one thing that will make us united, and it has always been persecution to move racism, to move classism, to move all the other isms, persecution to make us one. Now, Pastor Tim, the world persecutes us from the outside, but we all know that there is internal persecution as oh, well. Yeah. Pastor Tim, could you speak to our listeners today and uh, help us to understand when Paul says that we should live in harmony one with another, what are some of the things we should avoid within the household of faith that breaks our harmony? Uh, you know, Bishop, I, I would just put an umbrella o over and say anything that causes disunity, uh, colorism, as Pastor Brian said, um, economic status, um, size of church, uh, denomination, uh, any of those things that causes division. When you talk about harmony, and uh, one of the things that came to my mind was, what is, what am I, uh, what do I have an allegiance to? Mm. And whatever I have an allegiance to is going to come out in my heart. And so when you see within the body of Christ, individuals fighting over politics, fighting over, you know, racism and, and can't come together, it really displays what's on the heart of individuals. And so uh, our hearts have to first be knitted to the heart of the Lord. And then out of that flows all of the, the, the things that allows us to be uh, harmonious. And then Lastly, uh, harmony doesn't mean that I'm going to agree with everything that you say or do, but it means that we have an end goal. And if we can see the end goal, then we can work together to that end goal. But, but again, th there's so much division among us. And, and I would say anything that, that, that creates division, you know, we, we should avoid it. Pastor Brian? Can I segue onto that one as well and just add on to it? You know, William Seymour of uh, the Azusa Street Revival, one of the forerunners of Azusa Street Revival, uh, I, remember, I read his book or read the documentary and kind of one thing the Lord told him not to do was don't put a title on what I'm doing. Don't name it. Don't make this a denomination, if you will. And, you know, we're human. So sometimes the very thing the Lord tell, tell us not to do uh, could be the thing that we ultimately do. And it is documented. The moment they put a name to the move of God, immediately the spirit stops flowing that way. So there's something about that denominational twist that also brings a level of division. Pastor Tim named it. I just wanted to throw that in there, that it's documented. It was naming God's move that killed the flow of the spirit and wow. the in the churches. Yeah, that was um, that was very insightful, Pastor. But, you know, my wheels are clicking because <laughs> I go back to the Tower of Babel. Yes. And the yeah. Bible said the whole earth was of one speech. Yeah. And when God saw that they were going to use that one speech to mm. literally just get out of his will, what he did was cause them to have different speech. Yeah. As a result of that, people began to migrate towards those who spoke as they did. Yes. So now are we seeing that same thing in the body of Christ? I migrate towards those who believe as I do, even if my belief is wrong. I'm going to migrate, and we can now start thinking along the terms of I'm creating a denomination of like-minded people. Yeah. So we're sowing division by becoming denominational. That's exactly How right. do we get Christ back at the head of his church? I mean, come on, let's be realistic. I'm just going to put it right out there. And I know yeah, yeah. if you want to write us and, and debate this, you're welcome to do so. We'd love to hear it. One person wrote us last week and said, I wish your show was an hour long. So do we. But, but, but I want to put this right out there. I don't think it's possible without divine intervention to put Christ back as the Lord of his church. What do you think? 
gentlemen. I, I think I think we should kick out every denomination that has ever been created and call yeah. ourselves children of God. That that yeah. is it. Because the very word denomination means to divide. divide. Yes. And and yes. so and so when we when we look at it from that perspective, we've done that from the beginning of time. Oh, I'm this, I'm that. Yeah. And, and and instead of saying I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, and here are the tenets of the word, and here's what it means for me to be a disciple follow that teach that love that and then we can be we can begin to start bringing some unity back together pastor brian can i put christ back is it realistic i mean come on now we 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 no. danced around a lot on our no. broadcast it's and not. i get this i get this burning <laughs> hole in my gut because i can't be as honest as i want to be but no, is it possible i mean really possible based no. on how we're going today is it no. really possible to put christ back on the throne of his church without divine intervention. No, sir, not without divine intervention. And, you know, it takes me back. I'm, I'm a go back person. History repeats itself. Yes. So y'all excuse me for bringing history <laughs> yes. into my conversation <laughs> of now. But God knew something about the heart of man when he started the church, the inception. There were two people and God had to show who was in charge and who the people should fear. And Ananias and Sapphira learned early that you don't lie to God. You don't play with them. I say that to say God established quickly that, you know, worshiping me not the right way, uh, not being careful about whose presence you're in can take you out. It sent the message to the entire church. It was divine intervention. It made the apostles' job a whole lot easier. People understood and they feared the Lord. It will take divine move of God to bring Christ back as the head of his church. Amen. Wow. wow. You know, this is really something, brothers. I'm 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 both thrilled about the fact that it does take divine intervention. God's yeah. going to have to do something. I can't Absolutely. say. I can't say with certainty that God is using the pandemic to dethrone celebrities. I can't say that. I yeah. hope he is, but I yeah. can't say it with assurance. Right. But right. it does frighten me that we are inviting a supernatural move of God, because whenever God moves, something awesome and terrible is yes, going sir. to happen. Absolutely, And true. I don't know how that's going to look, but it frightens me. It really does. I love God, but I don't want to get him upset. I don't no, want, no, no I don't want him no, to be sir. upset because he is still a consuming still. fire. Amen. Yes. So we've we've come to the end. I tell you that 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 time goes so fast. Oh We're going to have to figure a way to lengthen this. So let's pray <laughs> and believe God to do something great, because I really want to go on with this. And my goal is to get back to Romans 12, one that we need. We need to first submit our body to God and then undergo a transformation of the mind. And that's what we're going to talk about in our next broadcast. We're going to talk about how these events from verses 9 through 21 will come to reality when we have that mind change. So we thank you for joining us today. And we want you to know that in spite of what's happening around you, Jesus Christ is still in, in charge. He knows exactly what's going on. I want to comfort you with the words out of the book of Job. When I can't find him, he knows where I am, and he knows exactly where you are. He knows where you are, and you do not have to be afraid. You do not have to wonder if God has lost his power. No, God was never elected in. He can't be voted out. He's in charge, and you must love him with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. And if you are a believer, get excited about Jesus. If you have yet to be born again, give your heart to him today. We thank you for joining us today. We thank you for praying for us, for writing to us, for just letting us know that our mission is being realized in your life. God bless you. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you soon. 
The stress of today's culture can cause us to live in a place of fear and anxiety, but Jesus invites us to a place of peace and rest, even in the midst of tragedy. In the Psalm 23 teaching series, Bishop Lambert reminds us that the Good Shepherd watches over our lives and helps us maintain a peaceful existence. Everybody's valley is different. My valley is different than your valley. Your experience is different than mine. When the Bible says God won't put on you more than you can bear, he's not talking about physical. He's talking about emotional, mental. What good is it to say I can handle this, but inside I'm broken down? Receive this eight-part series on CD or DVD with your donation of $35 or more. Visit ericmembertministries.org or call 800-650-9435 to order today. Learn how to conquer your fears through rest in Jesus and the power of God's Word. Praise the Lord. In Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul makes a very strong statement to the believers living in a totally ungodly country. He says, do not be conformed to the world, but undergo a transformation by the renewing of your mind. Our greatest conflict does not come from the satanic power because Colossians tells us that Jesus has defeated the devil and stripped him of all of his power. I believe our greatest conflict comes from being conformed to the current culture. We need to change how we view this culture and how we are sent by God to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. I'm Pastor Eric Lambert of Bethel Deliverance International Church and I wanna share with you some exciting news that I've completed the writing to the second edition of The Christian and the Culture. It's entitled, Cancel the Culture. This particular book is about 12 chapters long and at the end of each chapter, there is a challenge for each individual believer. When you get this book into your hands, I want you to read each chapter diligently and then perform each challenge at the end of the chapter. So I'm inviting you to purchase your copy of The Christian and the Culture, Cancel the Culture. And God will bless you as you take those steps to divorce yourself from an antichrist culture. I hope to see you in church and I hope to hear from you by email or letter that you've read the book and it has been a blessing to you. May God continue to bless you as you continue to look to him. The Christian and the Culture is a production of Bethel Deliverance International Church. For more information about our media ministry or to partner with us, visit BethelDeliverance.org and go to the media outreach link to make a donation. You can also call 215-885-2585 to speak with a media representative. Thank you for watching. Be blessed.